Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort here with Sarah Levy, the CEO of Betterment. And uh, this is fun because, you know, CNBC, finance, fintech, uh, consumerization, and people taking more control over their finances. I'm going to dive right in with the first question I always ask, which is, what is the toughest problem that you, as a CEO, maybe specifically of Betterment, are tackling today? I think the toughest problem uh, that I'm tackling is around how to scale a, a high growth company um, and how to keep the culture uh, as authentic and mission driven as where we where our roots uh, began as a company. OK, so tell me about that in the context of what's also happening in finance right now. The, the market's been on a 10 plus, what are we on, 11 or 12 year run since the financial crisis, out of which Betterment was born, right? And I, I think a lot of, especially the more recent retail investors, don't necessarily hold to the orthodoxy about what makes responsible financial management, right? It's true. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting because this crop of investors has never lived through a downturn. Right. So I think, you know, what we know from experience, right, is that long over the long term, diversified investing will give you the best you know, long term outcome. But when you're in a bull market like we have been, you know, people haven't gotten burned. And so I think, you know, you can get a false sense of security in terms of how smart you are and and not realize that there is real you know, information asymmetry in the marketplace that ultimately, you know, should lead the average investor to put their money in a diversified long term solution and, and not really to to gamify their savings. Right. Yeah. In a bull market, everybody's a stock picker and everybody gets to feel smart, at least for streaky periods of time. So give us a sense of where Betterment is on its trajectory. It started off as pretty narrow, but has gotten a lot broader into savings, into different kinds of financial advice. Um, give, give a sense of based on where Betterment has been, where you're headed. Yep. Great question. So today we're the largest digital, independent digital investment advisor in the U.S. So our first decade, really, um, we started as a, a robo advisor um, and really were pioneers in that category. And then throughout our journey, we added basically different touch points and different ways to reach customers off of that investment platform. So we introduced a SaaS business for advisors, and then we introduced a 401k business for small and medium sized businesses. And let me also, decode just a moment for those sure. who might not be as savvy. A robo advisor, right, is using software to give people uh, advice about what they should do with their investments and their money sort of based on the information that they've given about what their goals are. It's it's sort of doing the kind of work that a that a human would do, but you know, software leading the way on that. That's exactly right. And and I would just add that there are a lot of benefits to technology getting involved, right? There are many sort of diversified solutions that the average retail investor can participate in, but it, you would use a robo-advisor both for the advice we provide, but also for some of the tax advantage solutions, right? Our technology actually saves customers um, a lot of money over time in taxes. And that's a really important part of how we keep you know, fees low, so it's low cost, it, there's tax savings, and there's diversification. And so all of those things go together in, in what a robo-advisor provides. But the interesting thing I would say, you know, to the kind of trajectory question is the original idea behind robo-investing was very set it and forget it, right? I, I don't want to think too hard. I want to put my money away and I want to have that security and that trust. And so all that security and trust still exists. But I think what this bull market has done is it's given people more interest in having a little bit more agency and really making their own choices, right? Investing along the lines of their values, which has become a really important part of the investing um, journey. And so I think one of the things that, that we're doing as we speak, and then that I think is sort of reflective of where we're headed on the consumer side, 
is really to think about how do we introduce choice in a guided way for the customer um, so that they can have a little more agency, but they can also um, have, have the, the help and the support of the experts. And so an example, a great example of that is in the fall, we launched some socially responsible investing portfolios, or as some would call them ESG portfolios, um, you know, in the wake of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we launched a social impact fund, we launched a climate impact fund, and we launched a broad impact fund. And all of those funds, particularly for millennial investors who are kind of the core audience that we serve, have been just incredibly compelling because it's really the first time when investors don't have to make a choice between kind of doing what's good for the world and, and voting with their values and making a great long-term return. And so that's kind of a really exciting place. Here's some of what I wonder, right? So often when you go onto these financial platforms, whether it's, you know, a Betterment or Fidelity or Vanguard or whatever, and you look at uh, a mutual fund or an ETF, whatever it might be, and they show you performance, it's like, okay, here's one year, three year, five years, maybe even 10 years, right, to get a sense of how these things perform in different markets. In different markets, only <laughs> we, we've been in a bull market with the exception of a, a pretty brief period during a pandemic for more than 10 years. So how does an algorithm compare? How do you get a sense of what's safe or how things might perform under different scenarios when certain types of companies arguably didn't even exist before this type of market that we're in right now? Well, first of all, disclosures are very important, right? So we always disclose past performance is not indicative of future performance. So I think that's really important for investors to understand. You're exactly right. Um, but when you think about sort of the virtues of diversified investing, in some ways, the algorithm, so to speak, is not stock picking. Really what we're doing is we're constructing portfolios that are representative of the entire market. So one stock goes up, another stock goes down. We can't predict that, the algorithm can't predict that, and you don't need to predict that because on average and over time, the total market is where we have our customers investing. And I think that's, that's a really important point. What the algorithm or the technology is doing is things like monitoring volatility, so the ups and downs of the market, Market, right, so that um, so that we can take advantage of tax opportunities in an automated way to lower the tax bill. So I know you get this question all the time. What do you do about crypto? I love crypto personally, so it's not about me personally, but I think it's a really exciting new entrant into the market, and I do think that. The cl our clients are going to want to participate in crypto as an asset class to hold for the long term. And I think that is a reasonable place for people to be curious. And so what we're exploring now is how do we introduce crypto really as an asset class that has historically not really moved with the equity markets. I mean, we're in a bit of an interesting moment now with crypto and the markets and how they're intersecting. But historically, this has been an asset class that has not moved with the equity markets. And so some of the analysis would suggest that if you have a sliver of crypto in your portfolio, it can actually even further help you diversify. And so if, again, if we stick to our knitting with, we think diversification and not stock picking is where we belong and is where the, where the average investor belongs, how do we responsibly say to the average investor, okay, I understand you hear a lot about crypto. Let us teach you a little bit. Let us allow you to safely incorporate that into your investment strategy, but not to put your life savings on the line. And I think that's really important. How do you do it though? Can you, can you have at this point a crypto basket when, I mean, you've got Bitcoin, you've got Ethereum, and then, I mean, you, you, got, you got a lot of, coin. yeah, you got, you got Dogecoin, you do. I mean, can you make a basket of that and, and say that they're all similar because they're crypto or how, I don't envy you that problem. What do you do? 
Yeah, well, I, I can't say that I'm personally constructing portfolios. So I, I wouldn't want, and nobody wants me to pick their stocks or their portfolios. So I think the more important thing is that I have incredibly talented, smart, quantitative people, you know, working on the Betterment team who really understand, you know, how to construct a portfolio and how to take into account, you know, the volatility, the liquidity of particular assets. So I think there's, there's really a, um, a, a magic in the in the construction of the portfolio. If I were to prognosticate, I would say it will be a small part of a broader portfolio rather than a crypto portfolio per se, because I think that again, while some may want to invest that way, that wouldn't be the fiduciary responsibility that we take at Betterment for guiding them through a sort of long term responsible outcome. Yeah, you, you give people what they want, but you can't give them too much necessarily. Of what they think. Well, everyone can have dessert, but you have that dinner first. Right? There you go. Um, so now I want to talk about you and uh, what brought you to the point where you're the CEO of Betterment. And I like to start at the very beginning and not rush through it. So, um, like way back, wh where were you born? Tell me about you know the household, siblings, parents. Wow, that we're really starting at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. So I was born in New York City, um, one of the proud few, and I came back to live here. Um, I have a younger brother um, and my parents, um, in fact, my brother and my parents and I all live within less than a square mile of each other, still in wow. Manhattan. Wow, so, and you, you grew up in Manhattan? I grew up in Manhattan. So tell me about Manhattan and the change that you've seen, because I, you know, I, I grew up in the New York area, you know, Bed-Stuy in the 80s. I was in bed, you know, 79 to around 85. And <laughs> Bed-Stuy was way different uh, <laughs> back, back then. Um, tell me about the change that you've seen in New York and sort of what you remember from the environment growing up. All right, well, I'm gonna date myself. So I grew up in the 70s in New York. And so New York was, I mean, it was not the place it is today at all. It was not nearly as vibrant. You know, real estate prices were cheap. When I think about, you know, some of the apartments that, um, you know, some of our family friends were buying, you know, at the time, it just, it's just dramatically different from, from where we are today. I took the public bus to school starting when I was in third grade. You know, my parents handed me a bus pass and said, you know, you'll figure it out. So it was, you know, the city wasn't as clean, although I guess we've had we've had cycles of that um, and you know the safety kind of comes and goes but it definitely was not the prosperous place that it has become today yeah it wasn't it wasn't as safe either but we weren't as worried as right we exactly <laughs> right. we didn't have helicopter parenting back then right yeah like the the bus pass i remember um you know on scholarship uh all of us kids at least me through third grade went to saint anne's right we lived in bed -Stuy, but you know, my dad is a minister, so, you know, we, we would take public transportation from Bed-Stuy to Brooklyn Heights. And my brother, who, you know, I'm in first grade, he's in eighth grade, he's, he's with this first grader taking him on, the, on public transit, you know, to, uh, to school. I don't know if we would do that today. I don't think we would. I don't think we would. Although my kids are now in high school and they are pretty free to roam the city. So just a few years later than my third grade, you know, bus escapades. So uh, t tell me more about your parents and you know, their approach, what they were doing, working on in Manhattan, uh, particularly in the 70s. Sure, well, my, my father was a book publisher um, and my mother was an antiques dealer. And interestingly, if you were to ask either of them, you know, what do you want to do on the weekends? My dad would read books and roam bookstores and my mom would, you know, comb antique yards. And so I really took a page from that and thought, you know, I want to be passionate. I want to be as passionate about what I do as they were about what they did. And, and they really both turned passions into professions. Um, and so that's really what led me to the first, I would, I'll call the first act of my career, um, which was in the media business because I just loved movie and television. Uh, and movies and television. And the problem, of course, was that, you know, no self-respecting business executive would work in the movie business because um, it really wasn't a good business. It's a lot of fun, but it's not a great business. So I went into TV. So tell me, I don't want to get out of that period too quick. As okay. a kid, what were you into? If you were into entertainment, movies, television, like were you 
Were you always trying to get in front of the TV? Were you into drama on stage? How did that, how did that show? Okay, I loved to go to the video arcade um, where I was a master at Miss Pac-Man um, and also Q-Bird, but I don't think that game really exists anymore. Um, I don't know why either. I mean, you know. I used to, so, so I started a business. I started my first business. I was probably 10, nine or 10 years old and, and we were um, out at the beach and we would wagon. I would have a little wagon and I would go to the ferry and I would meet people coming off the wagon, off the ferry, and I would carry their luggage basically to their house so that they would pay me two or three dollars. And then I would take my two or three dollars and I would go to the video arcade until it ran out. And then I would go back and meet the next ferry and earn myself more money and go back to the video arcade. <laughs> so that now, was my first job. <laughs> if you were into Cuba, and that's the one where he jumped up the pyramid, right? Yeah, the, yeah exactly. I remember, I remember that. That was one of the that was one of the good ones. And I associate that also with Frogger because it's like you're having to yeah crossing uh, the street or you're crossing the street. And so it was quarters, right? You were it was you quarters. Were, you were oh yeah, you were those flipping the machine a quarter, a quarter at a time, of course. Yeah, and and what was the attitude toward? video games at the time. Were your parents okay with you spending the time in, in the arcade? Were you like competitive with other kids, girls, boys in there, you know, going out? Honestly, and they were just happy to be rid of me, I think. You know, <laughs> I, was, I was earning my own money and I was out of their hair. I mean, what more could you want as a parent, really? Yeah, it's totally that's, I have that Stranger Things image, right? Of kids on bikes and sort of roaming and figuring it out yeah, um, without all the monsters or supernaturalness, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, without that, in our imagination, maybe that's where the Dungeons and Dragons comes in. Um, so you, you're doing that as a younger kid, as you get into high school, that turns to what? So I was always a math student, um, a math and science student. I also liked languages, but I was sort of um, uniquely a math girl, I would say, you know, as, as I grew up. And um, I was I started an all girls school, but ultimately went to co-ed school. And um, when I graduated, thought about um, thought about becoming a, a math major, um, ultimately didn't make that choice. But um, but thought about that. And I was the editor of the newspaper in school. Um, I did model Congress, which was, you know, which was fun. Um, all kinds of interests. My my passion um, was summer camp. So I went to summer camp for many years and all through college actually worked at a girls summer camp in Maine. Huh, now I can relate to that too because I also was passionate about a day camp, became a counselor, um, all that. But I, I wanna go back to the math piece also okay. because when you went from the all girls school to the co-ed school, did the, um, did the environment around math change, right? Because I hear so much about how uh, currently, but certainly back when uh, a lot of us were growing up, um, girls weren't encouraged in math. That's right. Nearly enough. So did you run into that in, in your math mindset as you kind of went from the girls' school out of it, or what do you remember? It's interesting. I think that I actually had built some confidence in math. And, and maybe we can attribute that to being in girls' school where you didn't have any of that, you know, that dynamic, right? There were no boys to compete with. Um, but by the time I got to high school, I really just had a passion and I, I loved it. And like there was no math problem I couldn't tackle. Um, and I actually, I see it in my kids, both my kids. I have a boy and a girl and, and they both have the same kind of love of math. Hmm. What mindset did you have around um gender roles, right? Uh, and, and maybe some of that comes out of the confidence that you build up in a girl's school too. But you know, you've, you've had leadership roles over long periods of time in your career and in industries that haven't been so welcoming toward women in leadership roles. I'm trying to think what industries have been. Not a lot anyway. But uh, what, was your, what was your approach on those things and how did your confidence factor in? Well, I can't say that my approach was always right. I mean, this is, it's a complicated question, right? When, when I was a kid, I don't think sort of gender, the, the gender conversation, I don't think was as um, pronounced as it is today. I mean, there were so many fewer women in business then and it, that it, it almost was 
was strange if you did have a mom who worked, a mom who, you know, who was achieving, not who, not who worked, but who, who was, you know, achieving and the primary breadwinner in the family. I mean, typically, the, the, you know, the stereotypes kind of held in that generation. And so I think, um, you know, my parents were wonderful at just encouraging me to always do my best. And so I had just an incredible support system. I was fortunate enough, you know, not to have to worry about working, you know, through school when I was when I was young. And so, you know, I think I, I obviously ha came from some privilege that that allowed um, allowed for me to be, um, you know, to really devote myself to school. Um, I think the gender question probably emerged more for me as I entered, um, you know, as I entered the professional world. Um, where you're right, you know, although media actually has a lot of women and I spent 25 years in media, um, but they don't have a lot of women at the top. And so the, the question of role models, I actually had an early job um, out of, uh, while I was in business school, I worked at Goldman Sachs for the summer. Um, and it was my first experience being in a place where really all of management was men. And, and this was, you know, in the, in the late 90s. Um, but I didn't, I had a great mentor there who was a woman um, who pro you've probably interviewed on this show actually, um, but she, uh, she was terrific, but there weren't a lot of examples. And so the idea of building a career in finance seemed daunting because the question of kind of how are you gonna have it all um, was daunting, you know, at age 27, or whatever it was. Sure, sure, of course. So um, now tell me how the entertainment industry part happened. So after, Goldman Sachs, you, you end up um, at Nickelodeon? Well, it's, it, yes. Um, I actually, before Goldman Sachs, I worked at Disney. So my first job out of college was at Disney. So I really started on that kind of media path. Um, it was it was the time when Disney had just started re-releasing some of the, or, or had just reinvigorated their animation business. So it was the time of The Little Mermaid and Aladdin and, and uh, Beauty and the Beast and all those movies. Um, and it was just an exciting company. And so I, moved, I was an East Coaster. I moved to the West Coast, um, worked for Disney for a couple of years, and then in business school, made my way through Goldman, had this kind of, partly because of gender, but I think, you know, had this experience where I thought, I'm not sure if a career in finance is going to be right for me, but I, ha I had been so passionate about media, and so went from there to Nickelodeon. So you're a senior analyst at Disney. What did that mean? It meant I was, you know, writing board presentations and building financial models and doing strategy work, um, really strategy work for the studio. Um, I, I not being on, used to thinking on that side of the media business. Tell me, like when it when it as it applies to movies or what did that look like? Okay, so my biggest project, which now maybe doesn't seem like a large merger, but at the time was a huge merger. Um, I worked on the Disney Cap Cities merger. So when Disney bought ABC and ESPN. Um, and I actually, um, I've got to bring Warren Buffett coffee. That was a highlight. <laughs> so it basically meant I was the low woman on the totem pole and I was, you know, doing the copies and running the financial analysis and, you know, helping, helping support senior management to make important decisions, but, you know, doing the grunt work. Yeah. Disney Cap Cities. That was a big deal. I remember you know, talking billion. about that in college and how media was consolidating and, you know, that was a very big deal. Okay. So then Nickelodeon and this is um, this is what the rise of Nickelodeon, right? Oh, it was a lot of fun. So I remember the first time um, we we introduced SpongeBob, right? So we were in a meeting and, and I remember exactly where we were. And I remember the guy who stood up, you know, on the chair and said, all right, we're going to tell you about this sea sponge. And it's a crazy idea. And he starts describing this crazy show. And we thought that is never going to work. And, you know, here we are, right, the <laughs> multi-billion dollar franchise, famous last words that it is. So uh, it was a great run. You know, I spent 18 years at Nickelodeon. Um, I started in the business development and strategy area and then grew ultimately into the chief operating officer role and built a lot of businesses. When I got to Nickelodeon, we were really a cable business and brand. 
and we were just getting into some of our you know original animated production and we built a consumer products business we went into the hotel business opened a nice resort in the dominican republic um got into the theme park business. Um, so really did all sorts of exciting things with just a fabulous brand um, and some great, uh, you know, great content. Why do you think SpongeBob worked? Optimism. SpongeBob is the most optimistic character in the world. And, and everyone loves an optimist. Hmm. Hmm. And but financially, I mean, th there are very few pessimistic characters, right? I mean, you got Eeyore, and you could probably, like, I mean, for kids, right? Like, who are just down. All but usually, even if there are, they're, they're counterbalanced. I mean, Pooh's optimistic. Um, what, I mean, and as you alluded to, SpongeBob, the, the whole concept is wacky, but yeah. not just, it's worked so well. Like, I remember, you know, I'm too old to be in SpongeBob, but I remember when it came, adults sort of liked SpongeBob. Maybe in a way on TV, in a way that had only been done in movies, it was one of those uh, characters that played at multiple age levels. Yeah, look, the humor, that's exactly right. right? The humor worked on multiple levels. Um, we ultimately did a, a Broadway show that was one of the most fabulous, fun projects of my of my Nickelodeon career. Um, we were on Broadway for 10 months, but we developed the, the Broadway show for 10 years. Wow. Um, Amazing. And what did you see happen in Nickelodeon and to Nickelodeon as your time there? Uh, sort of drew to a close and you transitioned over to broader Viacom? Sure. Well, you know, we had a great run. We grew a great brand, a beloved brand. Um, but I think ultimately we were really, really dependent on um, the cable business. And while we while we built other extensions, they, they were always kind of anchored on the cable business. And so what happened probably after, you know, 12 or 15 years there, um, you know, we had had these really great growth years and then, you know, streaming came on the scene and, you know, we could debate whether, whether we made the wrong choice or not, but I, I remember the debate around selling SpongeBob to Netflix. And, you know, that was, was a really, really hard time for traditional cable and broadcast, right? Because there was just a better way, right? The consumer didn't like the cable bundle. The consumer didn't like, didn't and doesn't, right? Like advertising and, you know, enter Netflix with, with a, just a new way to do things. And the idea that sort of content is king is always what we believed. And then suddenly platform was queen. Right. And, and the idea that the power dynamic really shifted from the content to the platform. And we believed at that time that there was some incremental revenue to be had. And, and it's a great lesson sort of in retrospect. But we believed that, you know, sort of if we gave them the content, that would be OK. We would get incremental revenue and then we would take the content back because they were just renting it. And then if they got bigger, then we would get paid more for that content. And what I think we underappreciated was that the experience was so far superior that that our great content drew consumers there but then the experience kept them there regardless of what the content was. And then they were able to build, you know, fantastic original content around it. And then, you know, the rest kind of is history. So, um, and the lessons are so interesting and it wasn't just, you know, Nickelodeon, Viacom, et cetera, who were thinking in that mindset, would the thing to do have been in that situation, lean into the shift, the disruption, the change, develop your own over the top app. And you know, you, you gotta have the king and the queen, right? Like you, you content might be king, but don't don't leave it alone out there. Also have the platform that you marry to it and bring them out together. You know, it, look, it was hard to see at the time. And I think, you know, in retrospect, the answer is probably yes. I think in the moment, and, and this is a lesson kind of across industries, right? You have, you know, existing economics in your business that are so incredibly compelling. And, and so, you know, one of the reasons that I ultimately left media and, and came to FinTech was really about being on the other side of the digital transformation, right? And, and so I think, you know, it's a lesson in how digital can be disruptive, right? I mean, you look at Amazon and Walmart and what Amazon was able to 
do because the stock market allowed them to lose money for years and years and years, right? And Walmart didn't have that luxury. And, you know, we could debate, you know, Walmart's, you know, comeback fighting um, strong. And, and now I think, you know, they're viable competitors. But I think making that transition is harder than it looks sort of, you know, as a Monday morning quarterback. A absolutely. I mean, you're talking to a guy in the media business, you know, who started off in newspapers. So <laughs> I'm, I'm right there. I'm right there with you. You know, you, you think you understand the game and then, you know, the game plays you. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so then I, I want to talk about it's a it's an experience that I call Death Valley that so many people have lowest point career wise, often a time where uh, you hit uh, a challenge or a difficulty where you think it's practically derailed you uh, and maybe you have to change your complete plan or you know rethink everything that that you intended about your trajectory did you have an experience like that wow that's a deep question um i think that probably that experience for me was actually at the end of my viacom tenure so i didn't have an experience like that kind of coming up i mean i had a few opportunities along the way where you know i wasn't sure if i was going to get that next promotion and then someone came calling from you know an, a competitor and i had a moment at where i thought you know should i jump and I didn't make those moves and I sort of stayed loyal and stayed the course and ultimately spent 21 years of ICOM. So coming to the end, it was really hard to acknowledge um, that the time had come. And I think, you know, I almost was given a life raft in that we announced a merger with CBS right at the end of 2019. And that became like a, a, a graceful time to depart. Um, but it was reaching a point where you could see strategically that the business wasn't heading in a place that felt personally exciting. And yet I had devoted 21 years to this business. And so I think that was probably the hardest moment for me um, was making that decision to say, you know what, wherever this is going next, like I'm not a believer anymore. And if I'm not a believer, I can't do it. Why was that hard? Was it because of the people and the relationships was it because of a of a mindset around uh, after that amount of time it became hard to separate you know Sarah Levy the the worker and the talent from the job. I think all of the above. I think you know you you get into senior management and and life gets fancy, right? You know it's everything, and you know it, it's what I knew, right? For twenty one years, I went to the same building right? Every day, like nobody does that anymore, right? My kids, I, I raised my kids at Nickelodeon and they, and, and I met my colleagues, families and their kids, and we had all kind of grown up and built, built something together. And so realizing that like this thing that we've built, the world is changing around us. Um, and there may not be an exciting next act. It's just something you want to win, right? We wanted to win and we kept winning and then we stopped winning and it was hard. What was your plan to the extent that there was one for what you were going to do after you left? The only plan I had really was, you know, sort of one was I wanted to find something to be passionate about and that was going to be, have a mission that I could believe in. When I joined Nickelodeon, I didn't join sort of Viacom, the cable company. I joined Nickelodeon, the brand, because I saw what Disney had done and I saw sort of the opportunity. And so I wanted to feel that excitement again. And I wanted to feel that both in the product and the mission of the company. And then I also wanted to feel that in sort of the business opportunity. And so, so Betterment ended up, you know, it was really kind of fortuitous um, that I was able to find a company where, you know, I loved the founder. I thought he was fantastic. Um, I, I loved the mission. Um, and I felt like there was a brand here just kind of waiting to explode. Um, and, and so, you know, it was just kind of the right place at the right time. And I feel incredibly lucky to have found it. So how did that happen? Um, you know, you, you've got uh, a history in the entertainment industry and people find finances boring, <laughs> right? So maybe in a way it's a great fit. <laughs> well, not but, anymore. I don't think people find finances boring. I well, mean, stonks and Reddit and, you know. True, true uh, but if you talk to people about 
okay, well, let's go through your finances. People find a lot of times financial topics and investing intimidating, yeah. right? Um, whereas nobody is intimidated by SpongeBob. Um, so, so is that part of the reason why that conversation takes place or is it an intentional shift getting out of one space and into another? Um, I almost think neither. I mean, I, th I think more an intentional shift. Part of it was I wanted to learn something new, right? I felt like I had exhausted the amount of time I could talk about, you know, streaming video, right? <laughs> There's just a limit to that. And, and I think, you know, in the media business, um, the creative energy is incredibly fun, but I personally was not making the content. And so I think if you're making the content, that can be a forever career. But I was on, in, on the business side of really, you know, building, building it. And so when you stop seeing the potential of what you're building, you know, the, the bloom is a little bit off the rose. And I think here the opportunity was really about building, right? It was about a mission to make people's lives better. I love that mission, right? And it was about an easy to use technology that frankly, I had never heard of when I got here. And I thought, wow, that's the opportunity. The opportunity is to make this brand famous. And I know how to do that. Um, and the opportunity is to scale this business, you know, um, and to take sort of young executives and mentor them and build them and build, you know, build something that could be ours collectively. And that's what we did at Nickelodeon in the early years. And it just excite, you know, I thought, oh, wow, if I can get that excitement back, that's what I'm looking for. And it just fell into place. What's the initial conversation and who's it with that, uh, that makes you know you're interested? You know, the very first conversation was actually with a board member. So there was a board member who found me um, through uh, through a friend, really, through a well, through through a business school uh, con connection. And you know, they had served on a board together or worked together. And and John, the founder, was looking for an operating executive to compliment him, not necessarily looking for a CEO, or to my knowledge, not necessarily looking for a CEO. And um, and so I came in really to talk to him about how could I be his partner and help scale the business. And he was my second meeting. And how did it turn into CEO? I don't know what I did. But here I am. No, it, um, I'll tell you, they put me through the ringer, right? So I met the whole team. I met the whole team again. Um, I think they almost hired someone else. But then, as luck would have it, um, they asked me to come in as an as a consultant. And because I think, you know, candidly, I think it was fair. There was some skepticism about, you know, how does this, you know, SpongeBob girl sort of make the transition? And um, but but it, it really just worked. So I came in and I worked as a consultant for about six or eight weeks, worked with John, worked with the board and presented, you know, a point of view about sort of fresh perspective, fresh eyes, a point of view about where to take the business next. And everyone got excited that it was, you know, a fit. And, and I think a, a personal fit was really important. You know, I had to like them. They had to like me. So I've taken a more circuitous route than I normally do to <laughs> connecting uh, Death Valley to the core belief, but I've noticed this connection where whatever it is that helps someone get through that Death Valley experience tends to be a core belief that's then a tool in their toolbox that they can go back to again and again. So in this situation, the, the difficulty in leaving Viacom and figuring out what that next passion was going to be, what's the core belief that got you through that experience? I think the core belief for me was that I didn't need to, that, that I had built sort of skills and a network and there were people who loved me. I mean, the hardest part about leaving Viacom, honestly, was very emotional, right? More than intellectually, it was clearly the right thing to do, but emotionally, it was really hard. And I think when I looked at the network I had built and the friends and the goodbye parties, and I felt like, you know what, I made an impact here and I made an impact on people um, and they made an impact on me. And, and that was really the takeaway. And so I thought for my next step, it's the people. I, I really want to surround myself with people who I believe can be part of like a shared mission and a shared um, friendship and value system 
And so, you know, meeting John and really connecting with him, that to me was sort of the first step on a journey of like, wow. And as I read, you know, I went through the Betterment website and I read the Betterment way, which is sort of the core values and principles of the company. And I thought, wow, there's really something here that excites me and is probably going to excite other people like me. Hmm. Has it affected the way you recruit and hire? You know, the amazing thing is Betterment has always recruited and hired in in an incredibly sort of mission and values driven way. I mean, people who come to work here, they're believers. And I think that culture, you know, through COVID, that culture held us together incredibly well because the people who are here really want to be here. Um, and that's really nice. Like we've just come back to the office and seeing people come back to the office and like hug each other and, and then be like, well, wait, are we hugging now? You know, what are we all doing? <laughs> COVID? And, um, but it's really nice. And it's really the, the, I just, I love the culture. And, you know, my biggest fear is, I, you know, we started this with this question, but my biggest fear is like, as we scale, can we hold on to that? Um, cause it really is what makes this place special. Yeah, it's funny. We're doing a little bit of that here too at CNBC headquarters. I've been here pretty much through the whole pandemic, but very few people have been in the building. Now people are starting to show up and it's in my professional career, the closest thing to that back to school feeling where you see somebody after a long, and you're like, oh, hey. Oh, you've know. grown, look at that. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not too much at this point, but yes. Yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> metaphorically grown, uh, hopefully. So uh, I also like to, to ask sometimes, what's your best failure? The thing that didn't work out the way you planned that you learned the most from? My best failure. Oh, I, well, it's why I didn't become a math major in college is my best failure. So my freshman year, I show up at college and I take, you know, some now I can't even remember what it was, but it was some, you know, multivariable calculus class. And I thought, I got this. I've always been good at math. And I got into the class and I took the first test and I aced it. No problem. And I took the second test. And the professor comes and he puts the you know grade on my desk and it's a D. And I was like, I was like, that has never happened to me before. And this is a nightmare. And I and I went back and I collected myself in my dorm and I said, I am gonna ace the final and I'm never gonna take math again. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> you aced the final? I aced the final. I still think I got a B in the class. And that was it. That was the end of my math career. It wasn't for me. Huh. Well, I mean, c clearly you've done uh, quite well, but I, I imagine you're still using math as you operate companies. Uh, yeah, we certainly use math. And, and by the way, I can, I can, you know, make a spreadsheet like the best of them. So that, that's not a problem. It's more, you know, once you're in three dimensions, I, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now tell me, how much are you planning for uh, a market shift. How much do you think about that as you think about leading Betterment and the sort of brand promise and uh, and presentation that you make to the new customer uh, for, for what you're going to offer? I mean, I'm surprised that we're still in the kind of market that we're in given what we've been through, but how much is expecting a shift at some point part of how you're framing things? Well, look, we can't control the markets, so you have to always be ready for a downturn. I think the amazing thing and, and one of the places where I have, you know, incrementally shifted our focus since I got here, because this was a business that existed in our portfolio, but was a little bit of a side hustle more so than the, than the core of what we did, um, is our 401k business. And, and when I think about, and, and I will answer your question, and this is, um, just give me a little rope. So the, sure. uh, when, when you think about sort of the issues of our day, right, climate is clearly an issue, you know, that everyone's grappling with. Um, retirement is another major, major issue for this country. And, and the notion that, you know, Social Security may not be enough long term or is unlikely to be enough to support this next generation. And I see that as a problem that we can help solve for millions of Americans. And so to me, what is really interesting about where our business is evolving is, sure, you can have a taxable long-term account here, but you can also, as a business, small business, 
we could set up your 401k here and we can create for individuals a financial, a long-term financial wellness story for them that is not about a market up or a market down, right? It's about time is your secret weapon and starting now, even if it's $5 at a time, starting now is better than starting later. And it's just the power of compounding. So, so to me, I really think about like, how can we make this brand stand for long-term investing and retirement and security. And so we want to be, you know, easy to use and delightful, but we ultimately want to make your life better at the end, you know, and we want you to have less stress in your life, right? Day trading, we've done some, um, you know, we've talked to a bunch of customers and pr prospective customers and about this, all this like meme stock stuff. And, and, you know, some of the, one of the issues is that people who are day trading are stressed, Right? We want to take the stress out of your finances and finances are stressful for most Americans, for all, really all Americans. And so this idea that we can alleviate your stress and set you up for a better long term, to me, that's where I don't worry about market fluctuations because you ride the tide. And, and so, you know, last March, things dipped and our advice was like, steal yourself. This is a blip. And sure enough, like the, the those who held on came right out of it just as strong. Um, so I think that that long term perspective is just we're just going to keep hammering that home, which is like over the long term, on average and over time, diversify. That's how you will get the best outcome. All right. Well, it is it is tried and true advice, but backed up now <laughs> by some uh, algorithms and technology that hopefully make it easier for people to uh, to latch on to that and to continue, as you mentioned, to sort of dollar cost average in uh, without as much um, effort. And then tax advantages too. Sarah Levy, CEO of Betterman, thanks for joining me on Fort Knox. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.